Welcome to Plato's Cave. I'm Jordan Myers, and today we are going to take another step towards escaping the cave by actually re-watching or re-listening to an old episode that I am transferring over from my other show, That's BS. So as I said before, um, this show is basically the new start to anything that I'm doing related to philosophy, and that show is continuing to be um, a political show, a show about society, culture, um, a more laid-back discussion show. So this is a, an episode that I had previously done um, on That's BS, but I think it's relevant to this show and its topics, and so I'm going to carry it over. So here it is, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to That's BS. I'm Jordan. I'm Adam. I'm Brian. And today we are doing an episode on Aristotle and his virtue ethics. Um, so <clears throat> before we begin, I don't know, I think I'm predicting that you guys will enjoy this episode and this topic. Um, because so basically, in, in the realm of ethics, people generally tend to know three different ethical theories. Um, there, there are sort of three ones that people always know. Uh, the first is, we've discussed the two of them already. The first is utilitarianism or consequentialism. Those are kind of the same ones. And then a, another one is uh, Kantian philosophy or deontology. And the third one is Aristotelian virtue ethics. Um, so basically, if you've taken an introduction to ethics course, you know those three. Um, there are obviously a lot more and a lot less, but or well, just a lot more. Um, so basically, I don't know, I, I think the plan for this evening is to um, to sort of just ramble through this as we please. I have a bunch of notes in front of me that we won't cover all of, but I think it's going to be a pretty casual discussion. A lot of this is extremely personal uh, and applies to everyday life in a way that sometimes Kantianism and consequentialism don't. I think a lot of times they appear pretty cold and pretty calculating and pretty... Um, well, explicitly, they state they're impartial. So, um, this does sound fun. <laughs> yeah, no, I think this is going to be a good deviation from a lot of our our usual ethical topics. So, all right, the I th the logical place to start is um, the just for context, Aristotle was um, the student of Plato, who was the student of Socrates, uh, uh, and Socrates obviously came right after the pre-Socratics. And we're talking about a time period, I believe, in 400. So Socrates was in 400 BC. Um, so Aristotle is in the mid 300s BC, I have to assume. I don't know the actual dates. But just to contextualize it, this is, this is what we're kind of talking about. So he wrote this book called Nicomachean Ethics. Um, and the, the first sentence of the first book of the first chapter is... Uh, it is as follows. Every craft and every line of inquiry, and likewise every action and decision, seems to seek some good. That is why some people were right to describe the good as what everyone seeks. So there's kind of two parts to that sentence. You can break it down into everything we do aims at some good, and everything we do aims at the good. And then at the, the final part, he kind of creates a relationship between the two. So... I'm curious, what are your initial kind of thoughts? Do you think that that's plausible? Do you think it's accurate? Um, does it make intuitive sense to you? What do, what do you think about that? It makes sense from like, you know, one's own perspective that whatever action you, you know, perform or act upon, uh, that you're seeking some good in your own eyes. That makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know about the good though, right? Mm -hmm. The good, like I, I guess that phrase kind of bothers me a little more because yeah. I mean, like from a, I, I mean, we'll probably dive into this, but you know, from a serial, serial killer's perspective, I mean, his action, his goal would be to kill people, but that is not my definition of the good. Right. Okay. Excellent point. It would be his, it would be That's his, exactly. You know, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, that was, that was the question or that was the answer that I kind of wanted from you actually. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the two sentences seem to be broken down into two different parts. Um, the first sentence, uh, to me, and, and from the exegesis that other people have performed that have PhDs, um, it seems that the first sentence is sort of a very practical way of thinking about the world. 
if we have a goal, we we like we do things to reach that goal, right? It's just kind of how people operate. Um, and the second sentence is a stronger claim. It says that everything we do aims at the good. So your objection is is perfect, and it's the first one that's always raised against it. Um, and the possible response to it, and I'm curious what you think about it, is, um, well, surely you could be mistaken about what the good is, but you may aim at some false conception of the good. Um, so, so, you know, simply put, you could just be wrong about what is good. Um, but nonetheless, you aim at your misconception of it. What do you think about that? Hmm. Well, I, I think I think that's a fine way of putting it. But I think doesn't that sort of deviate from what he said, though, in, in, in a sense, because that's back to sort of your definition of good, right? Because it's like if you're aiming for some sort of good, you you, you view it as the good, right? Like any action that I take, I view as, you know, the good, mm -hmm. right? But um, I'm not sure once you take into account multiple perspectives and, and you know, uh, personal ethics that you can really classify a something like as the good. Okay, that's interesting. So, so you're taking. Go ahead, Brian. So is Aristotle viewing? Is he is he viewing the good as some sort of like omniscient perspective, like an all-knowing, like it, the good, the correct good is uh, it takes into account everything. It's not subjective. Is that what Aristotle is? implying well i don't think we should draw a distinction between something that encapsulates everything and something that is personal uh mm -hmm. I, I don't know if aristotle would make a like a hard and fast exclusivity line there that, that okay. you made um but we'll get to this in a second he he does think that the good is something that we can well define um and so i i think that I would say this, and I, I think Aristotle might say this as well, that people like, you know, a serial killer that Adam mentioned, um, they are aiming at what they believe is the good, um, but in a, in a very non-trivial way. They have a wrong idea of what the good is. Um, and so um, maybe there's a, <clears throat> there's a good way to kind of conceptualize Aristotle's point here. So... Um, <sighs> Uh, Adam or Brian, give me give me an action you did today. Uh, I drove my car to okay. to school. Back to back to college. Okay, that's a perfect example. So, what was so that was a that was a means per se. What sure. was the end to that means? So you drove your you already gave me the first one. So you drove your car to school. So the yes. the means is yep. driving your car. The ends is to get to school. Yeah. Um. So what what was the end? Uh, of getting to school uh in order to sort of acclimate myself you know um to you know my new home and room before i begin work on monday mm -hmm. and so why did you arrive back in order to better prepare yourself for work on monday uh so i would you know be more comfortable in my environment and i would perform better at my job and why did you set yourself up to perform better at your job? Uh, because I, I value the, the work that I do. And, uh, you know, I value sort of the, um, I guess, the, the role that I play in the, in the department. Mm -hmm. So you can see we're, we're quickly reaching a terminus point, right? Because I can sure, ask sure. you, why do you value the work you do? And you just you kind of say like, well, it's because I value it. Like, I think it'll, maybe it'll, you know, like, I would because assume. It, it, yeah, just, yeah, it just brings me fulfillment and, you know, yeah, some exactly. sort, of, sort of purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and Aristotle thinks that there is this hierarchy of ends that we can always pursue in this manner. So, so this is where the two sentences link up, right? Um, everything we do aims at some good and everything we do aims at the good. Um, so it seemed like you were quickly getting closer and closer to this actually very Aristotelian conception of the good. Um, so Aristotle says there's this sort of, um, there's like a chain of desires almost that you have, a chain of actions, and you do one to get to the other, 
to get to the other. And <clears throat> he, uh, he doesn't think that this uh, trend can continue forever. He, he, he believes that like this can't end in just an infinite regress, right? Because we even kind of reached a stopping point with you. It's just like, well, I want to live a well life. You know, at, at that point, it was just like, there is no after that. Um, yeah. yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. And so um, Aristotle says that um, this is that, that final barrier that we hit, that is the good. And Aristotle says that this is something called eudaimonia. Um, which he defines as, and we'll we'll get into like packing uh, unpacking this, but he says that um, everything we do aims at some good, and all these things aim at the good, which is eudaimonia or a well lived, excellent life. Um, so so that's his sort of hierarchy. Um, do you find this more or less plausible so far? Oh yeah, I think so. I mean, if if the goal, if you sort of like uh, arrive at the end, just sort of like seeking uh, just a, a better life and just sort of fulfillment and um, I, I don't know, just some sort of sense of wholeness, I, I suppose you would arrive at that same position with the serial killer too if you were to go back far enough. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, yeah, I guess personal fulfillment the joy he gets mm. from it why does he do it yeah i, I could i could see you going back that you, you'd probably arrive at the same bedrock mm -hmm. even if perhaps we would want to say that he, he's wrong about how to achieve the best life or maybe what the best life is sure yeah um uh, brian do you find this do you find this intuitive in your daily life i i think yeah. i very much do yeah i think yeah i think so so even if you're doing something that is um, overwhelmingly negative there is rhyme and reason for why you did that that is usually you know correlated with some sort of you know positive emotional gain mm -hmm. so i'm trying to think like so the counter example that would defeat this is something that would be purely negative but it almost mm -hmm. seems to fall like why would you do something for no reason kind of deal because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it feels like that reason is the good that he's describing so yeah, exactly I'm, yeah, Good yeah. Point, no, you you guys are giving me like the perfect answers to these questions so far. Um, that's exactly that's exactly a point that comes up, Brian. Is well, you know that. So Adam raised the first objection. You perfectly raised the second one. Well, you know what about someone who does something for just pure evil? And it, it kind of goes back to Adam's uh, example. Even someone who did something that that we would consider bad or or wrong in an objective sense, like a non trivial sense. Um, they're acting for the same reasons we do. They're just, they don't have a good hold on what would actually make them uh, happy in a, like a fulfilled way and like an Aristotelian way. Um, yeah, that's a perfect response. So I mean, is, is it possible to imagine a person that is purely, you know, I guess purely masochistic that their only goal is to, you know, I guess achieve uh, total unhappiness <laughs> I mean, like it would, it would be like you know. It's sort of a <laughs> weird thing to say, though. Like their only goal is like fulfilling the goal. You, yeah, you know what I mean, yeah. To, to I, have I, the goal, it's like it in, intrinsically, like you, you have a greater thing you're trying to work towards. There's some sort of satisfaction you're receiving from attaining that goal, right? Or working towards it. I just wonder if, like, you you have like competing uh, sort of aims, right? You can have like just like living a well life, but there's also like fulfillment, which fulfillment like might play a role in that. But I think there are a few things you can break down, like break it down into, right? I think fulfillment and happiness uh, can overlap, but I think they are two different things too. You know yep, I mean, right. like, like they're, yep. they're, they're not, there isn't complete overlap there. So I wonder if someone could, you know, um, I guess aim for fulfillment in the sense that they're reaching their goal to achieve maximum un unhappiness <laughs> but also, <laughs> but, 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 you know, the, the wellness of their life is, you know, essentially zero. So even though they're meeting one goal, uh, their unhappiness weighs out the meeting that goal. I don't know. I don't know. But you, I feel, it would be I feel, it would be a ridiculous situation. I feel, I feel, I feel like a certain situation. Yeah. I, I'm just, I'm just throwing a hypothetical here. Just kind of yeah. playing around with it. Even uh, with that hypothetical, I think that under 
Aristotle's description, I feel like both fulfillment and happiness would fall under that one cloud of good. So even if there is one, I think what you're proposing is like a situation where there's maximum fulfillment, but such negativity and like the happiness side that the, it's ultimately neutralized. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and it's, it's, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't know. I'm just throwing out hypotheticals here. Just like, yeah. You know. yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's exceptionally ab abstract. Uh, so it's hard to like think of a, a concrete example. Um, intuitively, I don't think that would ever be a case. Because I don't think that... How about someone that like works all the time, like they're a workaholic and they work like, I don't know, let's say like 120 hours a week, okay? Something like ridiculous like that, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Where they feel fulfilled in their work, but they ultimately live a miserable life. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, at that point, we're sort of like weighing competing virtues, right? Or like what what the mm -hmm. goals are, right? Kind of, I don't know. You're sort of describing someone who's just like, barely on either edge of just like some sort of crazy net neutral life it's like a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i, I don't it's know it's like a very strange yeah no, I, no. I just, i'm just trying to you know probe this model you know what i mean just yeah kinda, I don't no know. this this is you guys are actually just being a perfect co-host right now because every single thing you've said has <laughs> been exactly what i want you to so far good, good to hear for the first time yeah <laughs> you've been a good dog lately <laughs> today um so yeah, so Adam, this ex exact objection got raised in, in the, the class where I was learning this. And um, I think we, we can all recognize the sort of very real practical possibilities of this type of person. But, but even if this type of person did exist, uh, I remember the, um, the response that my professor gave was, you know, fine, I can grant the, the, the possible existence of this type of person, but... Um, I'm speaking as my professor at this point, uh, but I, and I don't think Aristotle could find this person intelligible. Like I, I, I cannot, it's sort of like at the bounds of my reason. Do you know what I mean? Like, well, I think, yeah. yeah, well, I think, I think because a person that would act in such a way would act like implicitly, implicitly without reason, because mm -hmm. it's, it's the reason is like the metric by which we, I mean, it feels like the, the the reason behind what we do anything is working towards that ultimate good that Aristotle is describing. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> it is it, it's weird to conceptualize someone who was working for something that wasn't like a, a high value of theirs. What it is like, very strange. Yeah, how about like the other end of the spectrum though, for like sort of balancing fulfillment and happiness though. How about someone that's just purely hedonistic, right? That mm -hmm. they're achieving no fulfillment in their life, but they're you know, living a life of pure pleasure, but ultimately they feel unfulfilled. Yes, this, that's a great example. So Aristotle is going to say that um, there's definitely different aspects of a well-lived life. And you're sort of, you're, you're pointing out, um, well, what if, what if someone had uh, a totality of sort of like one aspect, but was just totally bereft of another aspect. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and, and that's, it's definitely at least theoretically possible. Um, and, and Aristotle, I think, would say that that's fine. This person just simply isn't living the best life they could live at that point. They're probably living a, you know, <clears throat> if you're, if you're, you know, hedonically satisfied all the time, you're probably not living like the worst life imaginable, but you're, you're probably like, even by your own standards, not living the best life you could reasonably sure, speaking sure right? sure sure that makes sense yeah <laughs> yeah okay okay excellent so so let's get into defining this term that we introduced eudaimonia <clears throat> so remember aristotle said that like eudaimonia or the life of eudaimonia is a a well-lived excellent life and excellent here is is a pretty purposeful term um so you know, if we're, if we're kind of thinking back and saying, okay, what is a well-lived life? It seems like we already think there are different aspects to it. Um, and you might say that, well, you know, because there's disagreement among people, um, is, is eudaimonia based on convention? Maybe it's like what people agree is the best of life. And Aristotle emphatically says no to this. Um, he has the very strong claim that what is good uh, for humans and what constitutes a well-lived life is not just convention. So he's basically granting the existence of a world in which everyone agrees on the wrong answer. Um, 
so you you can <clears throat> i don't know i think um you can see an analog of this in something like a cult right like everyone agrees in a cult or you know in a religion therefore uh or just as well that that you can find total agreement on something that is wrong right sure and so a aristotle's granting the existence of a, a of a society in which everyone agrees on what <laughs> constitutes a well-lived life but they're wrong do you find okay. that I, I find that very plausible yeah sure I've, no, I've nothing wrong with that one okay i i almost kind of i mean to like draw on a personal example i you can almost see microcosms of this in different like groups of people like you could imagine you know a group of friends who thinks that like just getting plastered like every night of the week <laughs> what fraternities <laughs> I was just yeah, thinking. yeah yeah exactly right like they all agree on what constitutes a well-lived life but but they might be wrong about that <laughs> you know yeah oh um okay i was curious if we would get any disagreement about that um but so so <clears throat> aristotle says that um there there's you know often disagreements about what eudaimonia is um that we were just talking about so he puts forth three very common candidates that are often put forth uh, as to what eudaimonia is. But he thinks that these are all wrong. Um, so the first idea that a lot of people say is, um, when you know, a well-lived life is a life of pleasure in a very hedonistic sense, like you said, Adam. Uh, and Aristotle says, this is not enough to constitute a well-lived life. Um, because it's just Aristotle says that it's too low of a life for a human being. Um, this is this is what constitutes a good life, in fact, for things like grazing cattle. But it's not enough for human beings. Um, we'll, we'll get into this, but Aristotle thinks that <clears throat> different different objects um, or different organisms, I should say, have different functions, and the human function is just it's simply too high of a bar to be met by pure hedonism do you find that plausible i just think it's just it's such a <laughs> very arrogant statement <laughs> like, oh no we're too, we're too regal we're too we're too stately <laughs> <laughs> to stay yeah i mean I, I yeah i mean that i mean that makes sense just because i think that you know regardless of who you are i think to some extent you know, the gravity of an existence sort of weighs upon you at, at, at points throughout your life. And mm -hmm. you expect more out of existence than just, you know, pure pleasure. You expect, I mean, existence is just too wonderful for it just to be, you know, just chemical reactions in your brain, just producing like just euphoria. It doesn't, it, it's not, it's mm -hmm. not enough. I mean, even if you don't understand chemical reactions in your brain, just, <laughs> yeah. just the concept of just euphoria seems like very one dimensional given what existence is. <clears throat> yeah. And what's pretty interesting actually is that, uh, I mean, uh, of course, Aristotle couldn't really know about this, but this is mirroring this particular point mirrors, uh, uh, at the same time, a very Buddhist thought that like pleasures are intrinsically fleeting and intrinsically temp temporary, and that the grasping at these constant pleasures, like just trying to like you know, you like you can imagine someone who kind of lives this way, right? Like they they I don't, they go to like the, a prostitute and they just like you know fulfill their desires there, and then they go get drunk. And they're just like, shit, like, I got to keep this, like, hedonism going here. So they, like, just do crack. And then they're just like, all right, well, let's just go to, like, a prostitute again. And it's just, like, they kind of keep just grabbing at these, like, very basal pleasures. Mm -hmm. And a Buddhism and Aristotle, I think, would, would agree that that is just, you cannot do that over a life. Like, it's just not what constitutes a good life. Um, I, I, I very much agree with that. I think you did too, Adam. Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking about it right now. Whether that applies to everyone, um, mm. because I mean, obviously Aristotle was a highly intelligent guy that spent most of his life thinking about the nature of existence. So obviously, that you know, pure pleasure wouldn't fulfill him, or mm -hmm. it wouldn't wouldn't meet his, you know, his criteria for a you know a good life. But I'm thinking about someone that I don't know. And what about what about someone that just doesn't think about their own existence at all 
yeah and, and just sort of enjoys living in the moment entirely you're imagining someone who more and more closely approximates an animal <laughs> well and a non-human animal uh s sort of sort of i mean like i i because i mean if you think about just like you know i don't know people who associate i mean this is going to sound bad but you know people like like like, like think of like just like know. Trump supporters. No, <laughs> no, 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 Trump, no. Please. <laughs> but just like, like the hedonism, like portrayed, like in rap culture, right? Mm. Like, mm. so, so, like, you know, the rappers themselves have the fulfillment of, you know, um, you, you know, of producing great music and you know having a great following and just they're they're really invested in their own work, mm -hmm. but they're also surrounded by lackeys who you know just partake in all the drugs and like the pleasure and just they do none of the work yeah exactly and, and and you think about those people and it's like could i am am i in a position to say they're all necessarily unhappy i don't know if i can say that hmm. so go ahead brian no i wasn't actually gonna say anything i was just kind of mumbling over no, I wasn't gonna I was just I don't know. <laughs> was just, yeah. <laughs> no, it's fair. So I, I don't know. Personally, I I have a hard time believing that those people exist, but there there are see so there are definitely people who get close to that sort of life. Like the really just non reflective, non introspective people who just lunge at pleasure after pleasure. Yeah. And I don't know that see, any of us have ever had <clears throat> contact with them. That's how like rare they are, though. Yes, yeah, and, and the privilege we've grown up with is as well. So yes, I agree. Uh, and also, I don't think that it's really just practically possible to to sustain that sort of life. Even if you are that type of person, I don't think those sorts of lives get cashed out very often. Uh, if let's, at talk all. About, let's talk about Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, this is, that's ex this is exactly. <laughs> Uh, this is a perfect example, Brian. Yeah, we, but if, we, if, we, we talked about this in a podcast already. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting about Las Vegas is it's accepted and actually expected that you kind of are only in it for the basal pre uh, <clears throat> pleasures. Yes. And what about the idea that people like to go to Las Vegas and most people know that they're going there to for those basal pre like when we when we got in that elevator that one time and we were just kind of silently sit uh, like sitting there with our luggage there's this there's like these two women that were just like also get on the elevator with us and they were like you guys ready to party and it was just like it was the saddest thing from like a like a third person point of view but like from their eyes they were probably like hell yeah i don't have to worry about fucking anything right now yeah so it's just i i think it's interesting the the counter example of people you know, but even in that sense, like it's not a thing that people usually stay for. You know, people mm -hmm. go and then leave. Yes. Mm -hmm. The question is really, could someone live their entire life in the Vegas Strip and be and and live a well lived life? I think the answer to that is no. Mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, we should be clear. I guess even if the answer is yes, I guess that'd be I'd be shocked, quite frankly. But if the answer is yes, um, Aristotle does say uh, that he is not writing this book for everyone. It, he's writing it for, we'll, we'll get into this in a, in a short section. Um, he says that he's writing this for people who already have a contemplative or a philosophical bend to them. Like the people, I guess, I don't want to sound too like self-congratulatory, but the people like us in a sense. Do you know what I mean? agree yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so okay I, I think we we sort of agree that the life of only pleasure is not enough um so then aristotle says the second idea that people put forth is the life of honor and he says that this is also not enough um and and the reason for saying this is that honor is located in those who are honoring rather than the people who are honored um but but the good of a person must be intrinsic to him. So what he means by this is that <clears throat> like when, when you try to be honored or an honorable person, you're sort of looking for this. You're sort of, you're looking for a reaction from other people around you. Right. Sure. But, but Aristotle says that 
the thing is, is that we, we don't want to be honored or, or seen as honorable by just anyone, right? We want to we want to be seen as honorable by the people who are discerning and actually know what constitutes good. So, so the the real goal that Aristotle says that we want to have in this case is being someone who ought to be honored, not actual honor. Do do you get the distinction there? Yeah. I and I I find that to be very true, um, mm -hmm. because like. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's just it's very self-explanatory, and I think it's pretty. I think it's pretty. Um, it's a good point. Um, so then he moves on to the third idea um, that that a, a well-lived, excellent life is a life of wealth, um, and he says that this is not enough either um, because the life of money and the life of wealth <clears throat> is never chosen for itself. It's always chosen. Actually, it sort of collapses into a life of pleasure or a life of honor. Um, you're either making money so that you know people can see you making money, and and you you kind of have that like self glorified position for yourself in your own mind, or you you want to. It's an incremental goal, right? So it can't be like the good. It can't be what constitutes a well lived life because it's too it's too incremental. Like you, you want to get money so that you can get just sort of maybe unlimited pleasures or something like that. But but for the same reasons we discussed, uh, you know, the life of pleasure is also not enough. What do you, what do you guys think of that one? <clears throat> yeah, I mean that seems fair. I mean, it, I I think getting money uh, can also be used for other ends but i think those mm -hmm. are outside the three you just named right like that would be you know it could be i don't know <laughs> you you want to have money to provide for your family properly right mm -hmm. so and, mm -hmm. and why do you want to do that i think that takes you somewhere different than the three you just mentioned but i don't think money necessarily has to devolve into uh honor or or pleasure okay that's fair enough and and i think Aristotle wouldn't say that wealth is something to be avoided, but exactly like you said, you, you sort of get wealth. And we, we, I mean, you and I, like just in regular conversations have talked about this so much, like you want wealth so that you don't have to worry about things almost right. Like that, that's why I want to be financially successful. It's, it's so it can fit, facilitate things that are much deeper than that. Right. You want to send your kids to a good school. You want to have a nice house. You, you want know, to you, travel. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's a very incremental goal, which Aristotle is. <clears throat> he's not saying that it's bad. He's just saying that it's not the chief good of life. Yeah. Right? It's not. A, it's not an end. Yeah. Exactly. It's an incremental end. Yeah. <clears throat> um, mm. Okay. Cool. So then Aristotle says, "All right. Well, none of these three things constitute eudaimonia, but." What about being excellent or virtuous? And he says, you know, we're really close, but not quite. Because being excellent and being virtuous is part of the story. But the key thing is here is that the excellent or virtuous person must do things as a part of an active life. So you, you, you could imagine someone who is just like purely virtuous, but never did anything. And Aristotle says that that's sort of a meaningless, like it, it doesn't mean anything at that point, right? Aristotle is very concerned about action and life. I mean, life is clearly for him a series of of things that you do, and it's it's interactions with people and you know activities you pursue and conversations you have. And it's not enough to just be this sort of abstract, pure, virtuous person that never expresses it, right? Hmm. Mm. I'm just trying to think about that right now. Just, okay. you know, because to what extent can virtue, uh, like, play a role in one's life? Like, 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 I'm trying to imagine someone that, you know, just operates on that principle of, you know, where virtue is the end goal, mm -hmm. you know, just throughout their... their behavior and the conversations they hold mm -hmm. um 
Yeah, I mean that would probably be for a greater reason. Actually, that would be it would be for a different reason. Like you're, there, that's that's still incremental because you would probably be for you know fulfillment. You know, it's it's to fulfill a desire in your own life because of that. Like mm -hmm. something because it because you know your behavior means something to you. That's why. So mm -hmm. if that made, if that made mm -hmm. any sense. It it does, and and maybe I could give uh, an analogy that Aristotle makes. Um, he he's asking like, and, and I should I should give a caveat the the thing you just expressed where someone living their life in a proper way would sort of develop virtue right it was along the lines of what you said yeah where if if someone was i was just trying to imagine if someone was um if virtue was their end goal yes if they were, if, if they were just operating purely you know with virtue in mind and you know moral behavior um mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I think if you just think about that situation, then yeah, that moral and virtuous behavior is for a greater reason itself. Um, yes. And, and I was going to add as the caveat that um, that life would, would be a, a life of a lot of action. Um, <clears throat> and it, it would be this, this, we'll get to this in a second, but it would be a life of cultivation of virtue, right? You would be acting in a way that was continually, you were trying to be a more and more virtuous person. So that, that, that sort of life seems to me to be steeped in action, right? Or you could be a person that just is, I mean, whatever position you find yourself in, you could be as virtuous as you could be given the circumstances. Yes. Like, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like, you, know, mm -hmm. like you, you don't necessarily have to like keep, you know, leveling it up. You could just like, you know, given the money that I have, um, here's how I choose to spend it in the most virtuous way here. I can conduct myself in the most virtuous way to, but like, once again, it's why would you do that? And I think it's for, yes. a, a, it's a bigger reason than just virtue itself. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. This is good. We'll, we'll, so now we'll move to, I guess the part that we've been kind of hinting at for a while, um, which is a, a, there, this gets a bit terminological, but um, should Donald Trump build the wall? Aristotle's answer: Yes, <laughs> a thousand times yes, <laughs> and a thousand times higher. <laughs> uh, okay, so so this is good. So we've especially with with Adam's recent comment we've been talking about virtue right and so Aristotle says that um, a, a big part of this life that, that Adam already kind of touched on is acquiring virtue of character um, and I guess the the natural question that that Aristotle asks in his book is um, are people born with virtue of character um, or well, I'm sorry. Maybe we should actually back up. I, I was trying to skip um, through a few things. Oh, oh no, I didn't. I'm sorry. I was reading my my pamphlet backwards. We're, we're on the right track. <laughs> um, I, I did that thing where I forgot which way it was supposed to be flipped afterwards. Um, <laughs> no, okay, we're, we're on a good track. So uh, it, this is it, it's it's interesting. This is sort of the 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 nature nurture debate, but but in Aristotle's times. Um, so he's asking, are people born with it or do they acquire it? Um, and Aristotle says that virtue uh, is acquired by training, cultivation, and ha habituation. And he, he draws an analogy, <clears throat> uh, which I think is pretty interesting. So if you are um, you know, an artsman or a craftsman or, or someone who's learning a skill, right? And you're trained poorly and you practice poorly, well, then you're going to end up a, a pretty poor craftsman, right? Like if, if you're learning how to fence or something. Sure. And, you know, you're, you're taught pretty poorly. You're taught bad form, bad striking technique. Uh, and, then, and then you practice poorly. You, you know, you're kind of sloppy. You don't really give a lot of effort. Well, when it comes time to engage in a fencing match, you're going to be a pretty bad fencer, right? Sure. Well, Aristotle says that this is 
directly analogous to virtue or developing character or developing like virtue, right? Um, he says that, you know, practicing being brave in, in a situation of fear will make you actually brave. And the same is the case with practicing cowardice. So, so if you're, you know, over the course of your, your adolescence, you're growing up and, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're taught to run from your problems and you allow that to kind of develop into a part of who you are. It's pretty clear that you're, you're probably going to be a pretty cowardly person for the rest of your life. Right. Sure. Okay. Well, it, yeah. I, I was, I, this doesn't solve the nature versus nurture question though. Mm -mm. Okay. Okay. Good. No, good. no, it, it doesn't. Good. good I was good. just saying, no, of course not. And, and, okay. and I think Aristotle would concede that there are dispositions that people clearly have. I was going to say, because like all the examples you gave are just sort of like, they're, they'd be begging the question at that point. Of just course. like, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's like, these are clearly uh, nurture because, you know, you know how, you yeah. know, you learn how to fence if you don't practice. No. Okay, okay, go yeah, ahead. No, 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 no. Yeah. I'm a great fencer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was <laughs> gonna, yeah, yeah. with a sword. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, it's not perfectly analogous to that situation. He just, but he just not... lunges out of the womb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unga. No, was, yeah, okay, no, no. I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. The doctor tries to spear him with a syringe. He just fights him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Aristotle um, does not in any way deny the existence of, of predispositions. Um and and, and I, we we should you know remind the audience that he is writing about this in very pre scientific times not not pre scientific but pre modern understanding. Um, but do you you recall a, a few minutes back I said that Aristotle isn't writing this book for everyone. He he's he's writing it for people who are sort of like us, right? Um, sure, sure. He in a way he's almost writing this for the people who are the ones that will tend to find it, right? Mm -hmm. um, the ones who are concerned about like, well, what does constitute a good life? Um, and he, he maintains this selective audience um, because of uh, what I just said, that Aristotle places a, a huge amount of importance on your upbringing because of everything I just said. Um, and this is interesting. I, I'm, I'm pretty curious what you guys think about this part. So, habituation <clears throat> of developing virtue in youth is is more about the how than the why so it's it's more important that people are raised well and once they are raised well we don't really care why they were raised well but once they are and they're 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 people of introspection and philosophical interest then then they're at the point where we want to engage with them in theoretical reasoning, right? Sure. Do you do you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. I, I I find that that is a very accurate description of the way I, I tend to interact with people. Like if I if I meet some guy who's just a total asshole, like I don't really care why he became that. It's more of just like all right, let's let's move on from this individual. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. <clears throat> Teddy, Did, Teddy in the comments is talking about a meat vehicle. I just I, find that I, funny. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I haven't been reading it because I'm just I'm I'm trying to talk to you guys and follow the the, the notes I have. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this, yeah, no. I, I, it looks like an interesting debate actually in the live chat. I'll read it afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. But <clears throat> so okay, so at, at this at this point we are we're agreeing that you know th this this discussion is not for everyone right but it's for the people who want to become virtuous who want to live a good life who want to do the right sorts of actions and um a aristotle says that okay at this point then it's sort of logical to ask what are these virtues that we're talking about right um and there's, there's three parts to them. And I want to see if you guys agree with all three parts or only some or, or, or what. So in defining what is the right action, there's three parts to that. The first is that one should act according to the correct prescription. This basically means that you know what you're doing is the right thing to do. I, I find this very intuitively plausible. Can you repeat that for clarity? Sure. So 
the Aristotelian term is one should act according to the correct prescription, which basically means that it's not as it's not as important that you do the right thing. It's very important that you know you're doing the right thing. So <clears throat> if I give to the poor, if I give to charity, for instance, but I only do it so that my name will be announced during some congratulatory ceremony, that tells you a lot about who I am as a person, right? But if I give to charity anonymously because I actually want to help people, that also tells you a lot about who I am as a person, right? And, and Aristotle saying the latter is the, the virtuous action as opposed to the former because of how it's motivated. I guess, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to like derail us here. I'm just kind of struggling necessarily with, I guess, such idealistic views on giving money. I'm not, I'm just trying to think of like, okay. like when um, you, you, you like, a bad example then, fine. Like, no, okay, okay. I mean, if you have a better example, but I'm just thinking about just like giving money, even anonymously. I mean, part of that could be wanting to help, you know, subsidize whatever, you know, activity or event that you, the, that you care about. Um, but I think also like, uh, you know, sort of satisfying your own needs. Um, I don't know. Like, it's like, you know, like to feel like you helped, you know what I mean? Like, cause there's like a certain desire, sort of like a self gratification mm -hmm. that you sort of fulfill when you give even anonymously. That's fair. And, and and to be honest, I, I actually probably gave you a pretty bad example because it, what I should have said is that, so I, you know what, I, I gave you a pretty bad example. Here, here's the problem. So it, it means that, w so I'll repeat it. So you know you are doing the right thing. So you can't do it by accident almost, right? Like if someone, if someone, let's not give it a specific example, but if someone gives you um i'm sorry if you just if you kind of fall ass backwards into producing these great consequences aristotle says that that is not virtuous action because you didn't mean to do it right sure you have to, you have to intend to do good for it to sure, be sure. yeah okay okay good uh, that was that was wholly my my fault in the ex explanation okay so the second part and this is this is the interesting one for me i, I think um, the second requirement is that the general account given will match the subject matter. It will not be fully precise. So this basically means that you match the scope of why you do something to the, the appropriate scope size. Like you don't look too, too largely or too narrowly at a, at a, at an issue. Um, like <laughs> the, 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 the funny example of this is like, um, if you're, you're, you know, Adam, pretend you're married, right? And, um, you, you are in a, you're, you're at a conference for work and you're at the bar and this lady, this woman comes up to you and she's like, Hey, I, uh, I want to sleep with you tonight. And you're like, Oh, I'm married. Uh, I can't. And she's like, okay, that's fine. Let's just have a secret affair then just this one night. So if you sat back at the bar, you kind of said, just give me, give me a few minutes here. You like reasoned from first principles here. You're just like, okay, like I, I, I probably believe that like it's best to maximize like well being for people like, Hmm, she's, she's pretty hot. I probably won't get caught, but like, I, I want to be faithful. You, you, like, it, doesn't it seem to become like a pretty strange project at that point? Sure. Y you're, like I would find that a pretty strange person. Like you, you would want to be in a relationship with someone who just said no. Sure. Right. Be out of out of like loyalty to their wife because hopefully they don't really want to that badly. They're in a great relationship. Mm -hmm. Those kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you, Brian? Who's actually in a relationship? I don't know. <laughs> that makes great <laughs> sense to me. Yeah. Like, well, I'm I'm asking you, like your uh, your significant other. Would you be Would you be upset? I, I have to assume that you'd be upset a little bit if you if you knew that the only reason why she didn't have um, a little a little something on the side was because she like sat back for a few minutes and reasoned from first principles and determined that on balance it was the wrong thing to do. We'd be you were done just wanted to in the night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay, that's interesting. So then, okay, this then, then here's the third part. Then, um, the actions that are excessive or deficient uh, produce poor states of character. So, that's another way of saying uh, th this is the most famous part of Aristotle, um, the doctrine of the mean. Have you guys heard of this at all, or no? no. Uh, back in high school. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So, um, it, it's pretty. It's a pretty simple idea. Um, basically, Aristotle says that character traits are a spectrum, and there is a a point of deficiency, and there's a point of excess. So, for instance, um, a character trait could be how brave or cowardly you are, right? So, um, uh, bravery is the character trait in this point. And in excess of bravery would be something like brashness or carelessness, right? And a deficiency of bravery would be something like cowardice, right? Mm -hmm. And Aristotle says that the, the correct midpoint can be different for different people. And Adam, this goes back to your your you, you were hoping that Aristotle acknowledged the the point that we all have different dispositions. Sure. This is this is where that comes out. Um, so Aristotle says that the the point of virtue may be different for each of us. It might not be at the fiftieth percentile for every character trait, right? Um, but it's somewhere in the middle for all of us between excess and deficiency. So he defines virtue as these these mean points and vice as the extremes and excess or deficiency um and he he grants the caveat that there are some things for instance that do not occupy a spectrum things like you know murdering innocence it's not a spectrum it's just wrong um or or you know rape for instance that that's just wrong it's not a spectrum in that case um, but those are more individual actions and not character traits. So it, it's sort of, it's a different, it's a different topic. Um, but do you, do you guys find that plausible as well? Yeah. On it, yeah. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Okay. On its face, it seems fine. I'm just trying to think of like, you know, exceptions. Yeah, sure. It's the good philosopher in you. <laughs> 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 um, <clears throat> how, so, how, how, about, how about bad character traits? How does how does this model sort of play into something like? Um, hmm. I mean, is I actually I, I don't know. I got to think more about that. We'll move on. But I, I'm just thinking okay. of like whether like you know being uncharitable is the same as being is 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 greed. Are those synonymous in this case? Uh. So, so, you're would, saying, so, like, so, 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 so would greed just be a deficit of charitability? We, so you could say like, I don't, it, it is a little bit of mincing words at a certain point, but like maybe, maybe we could say like, so generosity is, is like a virtue, right? That could be like the mean. And a deficiency of generosity would be like, like, um, like scroogeness or like frugalness or something, right? Like you're you're sort of a miser who never like doles out money to any cause or any person, right? Sure. And the excess of generosity would be. Do they really have a word for that? I guess it's just uh, it's it's it would just be like giving be at careless, a point. Just careless. Care, careless. Yeah, maybe yeah. careless. Okay, careless, that's a perfect yeah. word for it. Yeah, careless. Um. So, so that I think does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just trying to think about like uh, whether you know positive and negative characteristics will inevitably fall on the same spectrum, just at different points. Okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think about that. But I don't what know. do you mean by different points? Well, so you're saying like if I'm kind of viewing this as a bell-shaped curve, or it could okay. be, or, or it could be just like a just a line doesn't matter it, it could be skewed also yeah it, 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 like yeah. that doesn't necessarily matter i'm just thinking about just like whether you know every um oh oh every, I, I, every I, bad characteristic that we can define necessarily has a good characteristic 
that oh, you can, okay. you can yep. move along that spectrum to you know what you, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You're asking yeah. if the structure of like vice and virtue aligns for everything. Yes, yeah. and I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm I, I haven't really found an exception to that, but I'm you know I haven't, I haven't like either. Because because Aristotle does say that there are individual actions, like I said, like rape and like murder of innocence or something that that are not a spectrum. Um, but uh, though, though it's a different you're you're sort of going off on a different direction at that point it those are actions as opposed to character traits um and, and to be honest like i uh i i haven't found an exception to the character trait one um but that's not to say that there isn't one how about how about you know coveting things like oh okay all right so like lust or greed or coveting then right yeah wanting something something that isn't yours that someone else has mm -hmm. i think you're pretty specifically so like the wanting someone or something is like itself i think you're defining it pretty specifically after that point right um like it that just seems really specific for me like you could you could say like the the mean virtue in that case is um like desire or being driven something like that right um well i'm saying it might be the complete opposite actually in this case like there might not be a mean to that They're like there might like for something like just having like a covetous personality right just desiring uh, just you know um I, actually I, I, actually actually the word would just be envious like yes. just just being an envious person i think mm -hmm. Being a person without envy would be just the best scenario, right? Like it, it would be good to be a person without envy. Yes. So I was just I was just trying to say, like, if you de define things too specifically, I think the spectrum does break down. No, um, I, I don't. I don't think envy is a very specific. No, no, I, I, I don't. I don't. I'm just thinking about that though, because like there might not necessarily be a mean for everything. It might just be like some things might be black and white. Yeah. So like some character traits. Yeah, no, I'm trying to think about it with you. Um, so I, I actually don't think that uh, having, I think you should always have some amount of envy that it's like a good driving force for you to want. It's like competition is kind of like a form of envy, like you're wanting to be the best, want to be better than the other guy. So I think a, a certain amount of envy can be healthy as long as you recognize. I guess there's like, as long as there's no kind of like disdain for the other person, like, oh, you know, fuck them. Like they don't, <laughs> Fuck you know what I mean? Poor. It's just yeah. like, if, if like the person in the first place, man, he's fast. I want to be faster than him. I'm envious of his title. Yeah. That's what I was trying to get at I, with being I, driven. I just wonder if envy is what should drive you though. You know what I, I mean? Know. Like, I mean, I think, I think competition envy, is a subset yeah. of envy. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe envy. So envy is the, so if, 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 if we say being driven, is um the, the the virtue here in the in the mean being envious is an excess of being driven maybe like it's it's wanting things so badly that you want to take them from others uh and then the the deficiency of being driven is something like like you know slothness or just being lazy yeah. right not caring that yeah. you're so worthless compared to other people I'll have to think about this one. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's over, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. <laughs> two to one. <laughs> yeah, two to one. You're, you're done. <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> um, okay. So so this is interesting because um, I think we're going to run out. Unfortunately, we have, we have a hard stop date or a stop, mm. stop time for this podcast. But so, so virtue of character um, – is is something that is is very much a part of um of a, a well-lived life and a another part <clears throat> is um having the quality of phronesis which is known as practical wisdom or prudence or being sensible or having foresight etc um it's a it's a virtue of the, the rational part of the soul um so it is so so there there are three parts to this as well and i'm curious if you guys think this is is valuable as something like virtue for a well-lived life um so there's three parts to to having the quality of of phrenesis um 
It's being a good deliberator. It's having good discernment and having good sensitivity. So I'll, I'll define them quickly. Um, having good deliberation means that you you correct you you deliberate about the sorts of things that make life good in general. Um, these are kind of defined as mid-scale actions. Um, things like <clears throat> you know general household management, um, monetary uh, having having good wealth management. It's sort of like you know those things that are sort of prerequisites for a good life. Sure. Sort of those things. It, it's sort of those things. It's like the the things that are the base level for like where you grow from, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's discernment, which is understanding practical matters or something like comprehension. Um, and it's it's the ability to form correct judgments about like general um, like plans or or it's. I almost view it as it's sort of like being able to navigate a world of facts effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the, there's the third point, which is sensitivity, um, which is being, you know, reasonable or sensitive in practical matters by taking account of a person's circumstances. Um, and there, there's sort of kind of two ways that this is, expresses itself. It's it's being sensitive like someone who's empathetic, and it's also being sensitive like someone who is like finely calibrated. Um, so it's like it's like it's being your you're like your empathy is well calibrated in a, in a sense. Like you don't want to be empathetic towards everyone. Like if there's people who are just like really evil people, you probably don't want to use empathy on your empathy on them. But you know if someone just makes a mistake or you know, it's just bad circumstances, bad luck. Like, so it's kind of both. It's both of those things. Um, so just don't and, be naive. <laughs> that's a great, that's a good way to put it, actually. Yeah. Um, so two questions for you both. Do you think that those are necessary parts of practical wisdom? And, and do you think that those parts are necessary to being, uh, to, to, to living an excellent life? Yeah, I say yes and yes on that. Okay. I, mean, I, I I, I agree that there's uh, three principles. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with them as well, Brian. Yeah. Um, so discernment, uh, and what were the other two? Be, having discernment, uh, uh -huh. being a good deliberator, and having deliberator. good sensitivity. Oh, yeah, I would, agree with, I would agree with that. And what was the other question? Yeah. Well, so yeah, I'm curious if you think that those are prerequisites or parts of a a well lived, excellent, virtuous life. No. Yeah. I think so too. Yeah. And this is so. This is really interesting. You know, I mean, I we I really didn't <laughs> actually. I didn't correctly calibrate my uh, my time allotted for this because I didn't know how interesting this would be to you two, but. I think there's, I mean, there's a lot. We could definitely do a part two on this. Um, Let's definitely do a part two. I think it's a good, it's a good topic to do a part two on because this is very interesting when you compare this ethical philosophy with its its two neighbors, right? Uh, consequentialism and and Kantianism, um, because this is really interesting, and and I have a lot of thoughts on this, and I'm curious to hear what you guys think, um, but. It, if you just kind of like, if we want to be just like really lackadaisical about this, if I sit back and think about everything we've just talked about so far, and there is more, but I kind of sit back and think like, damn, that's the kind of person I want to be. I 1000% agree. Yeah. I, this, you, you this, this, like, this, this sense of morality has appealed more to me than the other two. Yeah. So it, it, it is like it, it connects with me on a very personal level. I just think like, wow, like this is, this kind of goes back to the, the absurd podcast we did, but I, I just kind of think like, wow, like dude, if anything in life matters, it is becoming more like what we've laid out. Sure. Sure. I mean, you know I mean? yeah, I, I think, I think one of the, uh, I don't want to get a sidetracked here because I'm just kind of mm -hmm. thinking out loud here, but I think one of the only parts this misses 
but I mean, Aristotle acknowledges it, but I, I guess one of the only parts I feel like this moral framework misses is the fact that like, we may not know like which virtues are virtues like are worth maximizing necessarily or like, or like to what extent, you know what I mean? So I, so I feel yeah. like, you know, I don't know, consequentialism or whatever would better explain like maximizing human well being or whatever, you know what I mean? Like that, yep. mm -hmm. that, that's a better way of abstract, you know, uh, abstractly abstract. looking at it, yep. but I don't know, but this, this seems to play a, um, I guess a better role on how you sort of personally conduct yourself. Yeah, so, no, you, you're you're touching on like very interesting things that I would I would really like discussing in a, in a part two, which I th I think we should have one. So I haven't been very coherent tonight, but but here's <laughs> but here but here's, you've been great. <laughs> but here's what I'm kind of thinking though. I'm thinking like this, okay. this this plays very well on a personal level, but I think you know, uh, consequentialist view plays really well on sort of like a societal level. This so, is. You guys have gone above and beyond in in the, the answering questions because that that question, Adam, is exactly what I've been thinking about in terms of how this squares with consequentialism. Yeah. Um, okay. I I think this would be an excellent um, two part series. Um, so so we can definitely this will be we'll, we'll do a part two on this soon. Um, cool. But yeah, uh, I don't know. I just like this. This this really like this is so much more impactful for me than a lot of other uh, on like a very personal level than than ethical theories. I just think like I don't know. Like I said, like this is just how this is who I want to be. Everything about this. Sure. To close out, um, can you think of anything that you value besides consequentialist terms? We'll do that in part two. That was not encapsulated by what we talked about. Mm, no, I know that's my answer too. I've been trying to find someone who doesn't say no, because you know, barring these consequentialist concerns, we'll, we'll discuss them next time. But so, so how do, so how does this play a role with fulfillment, like general fulfillment? Yes. So fulfillment is. <sighs> There are, remember, there, there are these various aspects to a a well lived life, right? Sure. And so, fulfillment is it, it's it's weird. Fulfillment isn't really something that you can pursue, almost in a way. It, it's almost like you're fulfilled by becoming this type of person, the person who has phrenesis, the person who has. Um, virtue of character the person who has good theoretical thinking the person who has all of these things because we we've been discussing these in a pretty narrowly like like virtuous t way but in terms of like practical life goals i mean this person is the type of person who succeeds at their work but doesn't do it in a in a incorrect way like this is the person who like pursues things that me is meaningful to them. Like this is the person that, and and who does them well too, right? Like that was all the practical, um, you know, like the good deliberation, the good discernment, the good sensitivity, right? So, I think fulfillment is something that you could almost use as a a one word translation for eudaimonia. I. I once you lay it out that way, I, I 1000% agree, actually. It makes a lot of sense because I'm like imagining a position in which I'm I'm fulfilled. I'm like, well, it's where I'm finding the mean along that spectrum where I'm, you know, exactly, maximizing yeah. those those virtues. And I'm like, oh, okay, that, make, that makes sense. I mean. Exactly. That makes, yeah. That makes sense. No, I, I totally agree. All right. This has been a great discussion. Well, all right. So so we'll do a part two, um, but we'll close out for now. And um if any listeners want to be a, a virtuous person, you might you might <laughs> oh, boy. you might deduce that you might deduce that uh, you know if you value these conversations that we have and, and the, the podcast we put out, you can uh, directly support us by going to patreon.com forward slash that's BS. Uh, if you want to find out more about the show, you can go to that's bs.fireside.fm. That's our website. And of course you can um, 
in general, subscribe to the, the YouTube feed. You can subscribe on any RSS feed and um, like this video if you thought it was worthwhile. Uh, as always, you can contact us in the comment section below or by email at that's BS podcast at gmail.com. And otherwise, uh, thanks for listening. And I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I know we did. Um, so with that, thank you for watching and tune in next time. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode and learned something from it. And if you want to support my work and what I'm doing, you can do so by supporting me on Patreon. You can go um, to patreon.com forward slash Jordan Myers and donate um, on a monthly basis and receive rewards for your donation. Um, again, that's J-O-R-D-A-N-M-Y-E-R-S. And uh, the links will to everything will be in the description below. If you can't monetarily support me, you can support me in other ways by liking this video, uh, commenting on it below, reviewing the show on iTunes, or sharing it with a friend or with your Twitter followers. Um, you can also email me at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com and follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers. And if you want, um, you can check out my other show called That's BS. Um, it's a more discussion-based show with me and friends. Uh, I mentioned it at the top of this episode. So um, if you enjoyed this, please consider supporting me on Patreon. And as always, thanks for listening.